Now we're going to talk about the analysis that is flood seasonality. So we're going to talk about we're going to talk about all three of the analyses, and we're going to focus on flood seasonality in this particular lecture, and we're going to talk about how it's used in the RFA software. Um, so here's the name of the three analyses. We got flood seasonality, which this lecture is going to focus on, starting stage duration, and then empirical frequency curve. The objective of this particular presentation is to understand how to perform a flood seasonality analysis in RMC RFA and to understand how it's going to be used in the simulations. Flood seasonality analysis is performed on the inflow volume gauge data set. So that's the one that you were just asking about. Flood seasonality is defined as the relative frequency of floods calculated on a monthly basis. In RMC RFA, a flood is defined as any event where the volume exceeds a user-defined threshold for a specific flow duration. This is sometimes referred to as the peak over threshold method. And you can see in this image that which storms we have selected from this data, they're the ones that are larger than the threshold we set, and they would be identified as flood events because they exceed that threshold. So notice we're not looking at annual maximums anymore. We're looking at all floods that are larger than some threshold that we've determined. And then we plot them based on relative frequency um, process. So this plot right here, this histogram, is a result of flood seasonality analysis, which shows the months or periods of the year during which floods have occurred based on the discharge gauge data. The relative frequency is calculated for each month. And RMC RFA uses this information to sample the months during which a flood event occurs. In this example, flood events based on historical daily inflows can occur in most months throughout the year, but occur most often in May and have not occurred at all in August through November. So that's, that's basically what this plot is telling you, is when floods happen in your basin. So now I'm going to show you how to compute a new seasonality analysis using the software RFA. First, I'll open a new flood seasonality window. I can do this by right-clicking within the Project Explorer or by selecting Analysis in the File menu and selecting New Seasonality Analysis. The empty flood seasonality window opens, and so I'm going to enter a name and a description, and the parameter window requires several inputs. First, we must select a discharge gauge from the drop-down menu. So the only things that are going to be in the drop-down menu are, are ones that you've added. So if you only have one gauge in there, you're only going to have one option. Um, and then uh, you're going to select the discharge gauge reflecting the period of record to be used for the study. So this is a place where if you wanted to do a sensitivity, you could. So if you wanted to look at what if I use this entire period versus what if I use this shorter period, and you could have those both of those records in there as an inflow discharge gauge, and then... Um, then you could use those as sensitivity analysis. So, so now let's look at what, how do we set that threshold flow that's going to determine what a flood is. Um, the threshold flow defines what magnitude of event will be considered a flood and should correspond to a specified frequency um, from the volume frequency curve for the critical duration. For example, the threshold flow should typically correspond to something on the order of a two-year to a 10-year uh, return period. This is the threshold above which flows will be selected as flood events. There are two conflicting goals when you're selecting a threshold for identifying rare floods. One, the threshold needs to be high enough so only flood events are considered in the analysis. We don't want like something that's too small being considered a flood. And the second consideration is that there needs to be a flow data set with a long enough period of record so that a large enough sample of flood events is used so that we can reduce errors from having a small sample size. Considering these two goals, the threshold should typically be rare enough um, of a frequency that will still provide sufficiently large sample sizes. And this is something to pay close attention to. A rule of thumb to select a threshold flow is a flow that produces a sample size on the order of 30 to 40 flood events. Determining an appropriate threshold flow is often an iterative process. So this is going to come up again. Um, so keep this in mind, 30 to 40 is what we're shooting for. 
The next input needed is critical duration, and that should correspond to the critical duration for the inflow volume frequency curve. So if you have a four day critical duration for your basin, you should put four in here for this input. The final input needed to run the analysis uh, are the maximum events per year and the minimum days between events. These values should be estimated by inspecting your data. How many floods above the threshold occur in a year? How far apart do these flood events need to occur uh, to consider them as independent floods? You can also use the guess and check approach to balance these inputs with your threshold flow in order to come up with 30 to 40 events. So let's go back to what the software looks like. Let's first try the 10% exceedance probability value and see how many events we get. The 10% exceedance probability value can be found from the volume frequency curve. So let's um, look at the chart and we notice that the median is approximately 50,000 CFS. So let's use that value to start with. Next, we input the critical duration. For this example, the critical duration is three days. Notice that we just used the flow value, the flow value from the three-day volume frequency curve to be uh, consistent. Now we're going to input the maximum events per year. If you're unsure how many data points your initial flow threshold will yield, you can start with a conservative estimate on the high side um, of maybe something like five events per year. For more educated guests, though, you should probably zoom in and look at your data and see how many flood events you typically see per year. Yeah. It sure will be. You'll get like so many floods that it'll be way, 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 way too many. So you'll want to narrow it. Yeah, I'll show you here on the next slide for sure. It would definitely affect it. Yeah. Um, so if you're trying to choose how many floods to pick per year, just, you know, you can just glance at it and you can see these are my largest events and then maybe bump it down a little bit and say, okay, if I zoom in on 2017, for instance, how many big floods did I see? Maybe three or four or five, maybe two, maybe one, and just zoom in on a couple of years, just, just for an eyeball check, and see how many floods you actually see in a particular year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, it doesn't really matter. You're just trying to figure out how many, um, like in a year's time frame do you see. Um, so a conservative estimate might be five. That's a lot of floods to happen in a year. That would really be a bummer. Yep. Mm -hmm. on s above some threshold. This is just like glancing at the data and saying, okay, I see three that are big in this particular year. So let me keep going and I think it'll, it'll clear up for you. Okay, so here I've zoomed in on the 2015 um, in my inflow data set. And this is just a typical year. Um, and so from visual inspection, I can see that the threshold flow of 50,000 CFS that I selected is exceeded three times in that year. This is less than our max number of events, which I chose five. So that means that all three of these floods are gonna be included in my analysis. And because we have a relatively long period of record for this particular watershed, we don't necessarily need multiple events from every year. Um, but these seem pretty reasonable. I, I mean, this is, this is pretty reasonable. So um, it's an iterative process. So let's focus on the time in between events. Looking more closely at a few of the events, this December event ended around the third and the next large flood event appears to start around the 23rd. So there's about 20 days between these two events. And based on our data and our understanding of these events, they appear to be independent. So we can start with 20 days for the time in between flood events. Remember, there's some engineering judgment involved in this process. Okay, so now that we enter the 20 minimum days between event and hit compute, we see that we returned only six flood events. So what do you guys think, is that enough flood events? No, how many do we need? 30 to 40, that's right. Okay, so this is much too small of a sample. So let's take a closer look at the threshold flood and reduce it. So I'm gonna split the difference between a two-year and a five-year flow. So let's try 30,000 as our next threshold um, option. 
Okay. Using a threshold of 30,000 CFS returns 33 events. So now we're in our we're in our range, right? Our good rule of thumb of 30 to 40 events. So this seems like maybe we've kind of hit on something here. The distribution of events appears to be reasonable with May and December returning the highest number of events, which we happen to know for this reservoir, our flood season is within the flood season for a reservoir. So let's check the events that were selected and make sure that they correspond to high pool events. This is the tab for flood events. And I can see that some of the top flood events are present in this table, which is a good indication of reasonable results. The histogram of events shows how often the reservoir starting stage the re yeah, curves will be sampled from that particular month for an RFA simulation. So in our case, no reservoir starting stages will be sampled from the months of July or August. Um, and the majority will be sampled from May, November and December. So we'll talk about reservoir starting stage duration in another lecture. Um, now that we've seen how to perform a flood seasonality analysis using our inflow data, um, there's also an option to manually enter the flood seasonality data into this table. Oops, sorry. If you right click in the table and select manual data entry, you can see that the frequency column is unlocked and you can edit the relative frequency for each month. For this example, the final seasonality was manually changed based on an analysis that was done outside of RFA based on annual maximum stages. So that's kind of like a, a higher level. So if you wanna learn how to do that, we can talk to you about that. Um, but the inflow process that's built in is gonna be sufficient most of the time. You should perform a flood seasonality analysis for any duration that you're examining. So our example, we only had one critical inflow duration, which is three days. But so we only need one seasonality analysis. If we were examining, say, the one day, three day, and five day durations, because we wanted to do a sensitivity on the critical duration, then we would need to have a flood seasonality analysis for each of those durations, okay? So for reservoirs that are regulated to fill to a target stage each year, a seasonality analysis based on stage will typically result in a stage frequency curve that has better agreement with the observed stages in the frequent portion of the curve. A stage-based seasonality analysis can be developed by ev evaluating annual maximum stage, daily stage, and the reservoir rule curves. So this is the example I'm talking about where you might do this analysis outside of RFA. Always compare the infrequent part of the curve to make sure there's a reasonable agreement between the flow-based seasonality analysis and the stage-based seasonality analysis. If not, two separate curves may need to be developed and then blended into a final stage frequency curve. The stage-based seasonality would be used for the frequent part of the curve and the flow-based seasonality would be used for the infrequent part of the curve. So let me, let me just hit that one more time. So regardless, the infrequent part of your curve, you're gonna to wanna to base on the flow and that's what's built into RFA. And so that's why it's our default um, because most of the time in flood hazard, we're interested in extreme storms in that rare section of the curve. So that's what the inflow um, based seasonality is, is already in RFA. It's already gonna be doing that for you. And so you can see kind of in the picture here and we'll, I think we'll talk about this in another lecture, but for the stage, when we did seasonality based on stage, it matches the observed data better. So sometimes we'll have reservoirs where this is the case. And again, that's when a lot of times the reservoir holds the stage for a really long time. And so this is a way that you can better match that portion of the curve. And we'll talk about calibrating the curves a little bit later on in another lecture as well.